Uh, I want to make it very clear in the beginning, I'm not anti-government, I don't believe in terrorism, and I want to make it especially clear that there are a lot of good people in the FBI and the CIA, naval intelligence, army intelligence, military intelligence, NSA. Unfortunately, there are a few key people in key positions who have made a difference, a big difference, in what's happening in America today. So, looking back, my personal experiences, I retired from the FBI March 1979. At that time, I was in charge of the FBI Los Angeles Division. I had more than 700 personnel under my command. The Attorney General of the United States, Griffin Bell, asked me after I retired if I'd coordinate security for the Pan American Games. I did. I was a consultant in the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics. I was a consultant for former Governor Jerry Brown, California, California Narcotic Authority. So I do have credentials. My first major and credibility, believe me. Now, if you read the internet, you may not think so because there are some heavy-duty FBI informants out there like Stu Webb and Barbara Hartwell, who are MKUltra mind control victims, CIA mind control victims, who are making all kinds of disparaging remarks about me. But I don't want to deal with those people because if you read their material, you'll see that it's designed to discredit people like me, former state senator John DeCamp, and other leaders who are trying our best to expose what's happening in America today, and actually around the world. Let's go back to 1776, May the 1st. Adam Weishoff was commissioned by the Rothschild family to set up the goals to control and take over the world with a one-world government. Adam Weishoff came up with 25 goals. Among these goals were control the press, corrupt the youth through sex and drugs, elect our own people, our own people meaning the Illuminati, to key positions in all levels of the government, city, county, state, and federal. And it goes on. The final goal was to take over the world, the one world government. Information is very well documented by William Guy Carr in his magazine, his book, excuse me, Pawns in the Game. When I retired, I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea about the Illuminati. I had no idea about Adam Weishoff. However, my first major investigation when I returned from Puerto Rico was a Dr. Jeffrey R. McDonald case. He's a former Green Beret doctor who was convicted of murdering his wife and two children at Fort Bragg, February 17, 1970. He'd been tried and convicted and sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. I was asked by the defense team to investigate the case because they claimed that Dr. McDonald was innocent. I said I would, but if I learned that he murdered his wife and two children, I would discontinue my investigation and no longer become involved. I want you to know I'm still working for Dr. McDonald. He is an innocent man. Now, once I became involved in the case, I had to read everything, and I learned that evidence was lost, evidence was stolen, evidence was altered, an FBI agent, Paul Stombaugh, lied before the grand jury. And most important of all, Colette, the wife, had skin where she had fought off the assailants under her fingernails. That skin was handed over to William F. Ivory, the chief investigator for the Army, and it has disappeared. Ten months into the case, October 25, 1980, I 
through a series of circumstances, I don't have time to go into the details now, obtained a signed confession from one Helena Stokely. I had three sessions with her, 10 days each, total of 30 days. Helena told me that Dr. McDonald did not commit those crimes, that they were committed by her satanic cult group. And I said to myself, what's this all about? I don't know anything about Satanism. I read about it in the Bible, of course, and that's about it. But as I delved into the case, I learned that drugs from Southeast Asia were being flown into the United States to various military bases in plastic bags in the bodies of the dead GIs. I further learned from Helena that her satanic cult group was involved in distributing these drugs up and down the East Coast. They were mad at Dr. McDonald because he was abusive to the cults, cult members and the GIs who went to the civilian hospital where he was moonlighting for relief of some sort. So they went in and attacked him that night. There were a total of seven involved in the crime. She named them all for me. Right now, today, I know where some of them are located. But to further check and document this, I went to the UCLA library and I found out, in fact, in the Time Magazine, January 1, 1973, there was an article about bringing drugs in plastic bags in the body cavities of dead GIs. There was no question in my mind Helena was telling the truth. I gave her a polygraph test and she passed. I had her examined by a psychiatrist and she passed. And as a matter of fact, the government themselves had given her a polygraph examination early in their investigation before I entered the case. And Brizantine, the Army polygraph operator, said that she thought that she was telling the truth. She thought she was there that night. Now, the most recent series of events in the McDonald case. Now, I'm telling you a little bit about the, about the McDonald case because that's what woke me up as to what was going on. It was after that that I started researching and went back and found out about the Illuminati. Illuminati slash Satanism. It was after that uh, that uh, I learned considerable more about what was going on. And the most recent information, Dr. McDonald, who's been in the penitentiary for some 25 or 26 years now, appeared before a parole board just two days ago, his first that he's ever appeared before a parole board. And the reason he had never appeared before is because, in his opinion, had he appeared before, it would be an admission of guilt. In this particular instance, he still claimed he was innocent, but he did appear before the board because he's a newly wed individual with a woman named Kathy. And of course, if you read the papers in the last two days, his parole was turned down and the parole board made him eligible for another hearing in 15 years. This poor man not only lost his wife and two children, he has served 25 years in the penitentiary and another 15 years to go. He's 61 years old. I am still working the case. What are the latest developments on the case? In 1997, the judge, federal judge, agreed to do a DNA tests. And they, just, they chose 15 individual pieces of evidence to be examined. However, the judge said that when you open the evidence envelopes, only the prosecutor can be present. Well, they opened the evidence envelopes. The prosecutor did. How many do you think were empty? Five. Five evidence envelopes were empty. The skin under Colette's fingernails would have established Dr. McDonald's innocence alone. Now we have DNA authorized in 1997. Here we are in 2005. They still have not completed the DNA test. From the McDonald case, the next case I worked of a major consequence was the McMartin Preschool case in Manhattan Beach, California. The children there claimed 
There were tunnels under the school. They were taken into the tunnels and through the tunnels up into the trap door of a bathroom in a triplex next door, placed in automobiles and prostituted in the community. These are two, three, and four-year-old children before they entered kindergarten. In addition, the children claimed that they were flown into the mountains where they were involved with adults in robes, black robes, chanting candles. They talked about the brown babies who were, sacri who were cut up, actually sacrificed, and in checking into this and researching this, of course, this was obviously a satanic ceremony. The McMartin family who owned the preschool, they were tried of Dre Bucky and his grandmother. Uh, the grandmother was acquitted, hung jury on Ray Bucky. The second trial, another hung jury. I had an opportunity in 1990 to gain control of the school. Now, the school had been given to Danny Davis, the defense attorney, and he had sold it, even though he made $15 million on the case, by the way. He had sold it uh, to a contractor who was going to tear it down. When I learned this, I contacted the contractor. I said, I want to be given an opportunity to go on that school and look for the tunnels. The authorities had looked for them in 1987. They said they could find no tunnels. Along with some of the parents, we hired Dr. Gary Stickle, UCLA archaeologist. He hired his crew and brought them in. And in 34 days, Dr. Stickle said, there had been tunnels under that school. They were covered up and they were covered in. An informant of mine told me that there was an abandoned satanic site in Crestline, California, up in the mountains. I went up into the mountains and obtained copies, photocopies, photographs, excuse me, of the site. I have a lecture uh, that I give where these pictures are available. It's called Gunderson Chronicles No. 2. It's a four-hour lecture that I gave in Kansas City a year, number of years ago which shows this abandoned site and also pictures from the McMartin Tunnel School Dig. From there, I became involved in another case, a very frightening case, because I established, with the help of people like John DeCamp, former state senator in Nebraska, that we have in this country today a covert military, criminal enterprise, government enterprise, primarily by U.S. military intelligence that is operating full throttle and everybody refuses to investigate it. In the Nebraska case, it's called the Franklin Cover-Up. This is the book here that I, that John DeCamp wrote, by the way. It's all documented in there. And in that particular instance, they were taking children out of foster homes, orphanages, um, Boys Town, driving them from Omaha, Nebraska to Sioux City, Iowa, 184 miles away, placing them in private jets and flying them to Washington, D.C. for sex orgies with prominent people, including congressmen, senators, and certain people in the White House. It's well documented. I have personally talked to Paul Benassi. I had a five, I have a five hour interview with him. It's on, it's a tape that's available. I don't have it with me here, but you can order it. I have a five hour interview with Paul that I gave, that he gave me in 1993. Paul told me how he was used. He was part of the kidnapping crew and was used as a decoy and when he was 10, 11, 12 years old in parks shopping malls to attract the children over near where the adults were in a car waiting for them. They throw them in the back seat, chloroform them, and bank off with them. Paul also told me that these children, many of them, become sex slaves. 
medium are used as toys. The boys, they call the boys toys. I don't know what they call the girls. But these degenerate, sick people, the men are more interested in the little boys than they are the girls for some reason. But it's all well documented. Paul drew the inside living quarters of the White House. Now this information broke in about 1987. That's about right after I entered, just before I entered the case. I replaced a fellow named Gary Caradori, who was the investigator for a Nebraska Senate committee. Gary met the official photographer of the group who had split from the group, defected, and agreed to take the pictures that this official photographer gave him, and they met in Chicago, agreed to take the pictures back to the committee. He flew out of Chicago in his private plane, short di uh, period, a short distance out of Chicago. The plane exploded midair, and the, his briefcase has never been found. He and his 11-year-old boy were uh, died. His briefcase has never been found. The rear seat of the airplane has never been found. I had made every attempt possible to obtain uh, and obtain uh, possession of or control of that plane because I wanted to examine it for bomb chemicals, particularly the back seat. It's no, lo it's no longer available. Nobody knows what happened to it. Gary Caridari was a civilian, yet it was taken to a military base uh, for examination. A deputy sheriff was the first one on the scene. He saw the pictures. He started picking up the pictures. An FBI agent came along, took the pictures away from him, told him to keep his mouth shut. Uh, he started talking to a few people. A, a year later, his wife was murdered. He's no longer talking. This international child kidnapping ring, I later learned, was out of Washington, D.C. It was very active, and the organization is known as the Finders. And I have a report on the Finders back there. Everything I'm telling you is documented, by the way. The Finders has been established and operating throughout the 1960s up to the present time. It was exposed in 1987. They moved their operation to Wichita, Kansas, and they're operating right today in Wichita, Kansas. I have taken my report to the FBI a half a dozen times, demanded an investigation, and I have yet to be interviewed. So we have the finders. We have the Franklin cover-up, which documents what I'm telling you. We have the pawns in the game. Pawns in the game is the Illuminati. This is the Illuminati slash satanic movement in this country today. And the last thing I'm going to mention in the way of a book is why Johnny can't come home. Johnny Gosh was September the 5th, 1982, a newspaper boy on a Sunday, and he was about to deliver his newspapers in West Des Moines, Iowa. He never delivered any newspapers. He disappeared. The mother, Noreen Gosh, was dumbfounded, didn't know what happened, demanded an investigation of the FBI and by the West Des Moines Police Department. The chief of police in West Des Moines said to her, even though he's disappeared, we do not have any witnesses who saw him being grabbed and placed in a car or being taken control of. So we're not going to investigate it. The FBI used the same premise. They refused to investigate it. Now, I've been involved in kidnappings in the FBI. And I can tell you that it's automatic within 24 hours, at the end of 24 hours, that we had to go in, in my day, this was back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we had to go in and start investigating the case after they've disappeared for 24 hours. Today, as we, as I stand here and you sit there, 
the children are disappearing in this country at the rate of 83 per hour. That's over 700,000 children a year. Now I can go back to July 1982. The Reader's Digest claimed there were 100,000 children disappearing every year. There's another statistic that I find very interesting, and that is that it is estimated 2,500 children are kidnapped and murdered in this country every year. That's an unbelievable figure. Yet, the FBI refuses to investigate it. Now, after the Nebraska case, and part of the Nebraska case, most recently, we have a young man named Jeff Gannon, who has appeared in the White House using a fraudulent press pass. This has happened within the last month. The uh, certain people in the White House were questioning him and were suspicious of him because when he would engage in a press conference with the president, President Bush, he was asking what they call soft questions. Soft questions meaning the president would have an answer for them. He'd look good. Somebody started checking into his background. They learned that he was actually an individual named Jim Guckert. This is all on the internet, by the way. And Guckert had a homosexual website. So Jeff Gannon is an alias of Jim Guckert. Now his picture appeared in the internet and he is believed to be Johnny Gosh, who was kidnapped September the 5th, 1982. The mother, Noreen Gosh, who wrote this book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home, I have a two-hour interview with her on video, available again if you want to uh, check my uh, order blank. She did not sit still for this. Can you imagine if the 83 mothers of children who disappear every hour would do what Noreen Gosh has done? We wouldn't have this problem today. She went to the FBI, demanded an investigation. They refused to investigate. The police refused to investigate because the case tied into the Franklin cover-up. Some of our top politicians in the country, leading businessmen, Harold Anderson was identified by the children, past publisher of the Omaha World Herald. The head of the Nebraska Forestry Service was identified by these children. There are 80 children came forward in this Nebraska case. And it goes, as I said, right up to the White House. In 1987, according to Paul Benassi, he was furnishing toys, or little boys, young boys, to the sick people, certain sick individuals in the White House itself. I have the names of some of these people. No need to mention it here. Some of them are mentioned in the Franklin cover-up. But it does appear that Jeff Gannon is, in fact, Johnny Gosh. Noreen Gosh, the mother, has looked at the pictures she believes it's Johnny Gosh because he has a scar on his right cheek about the size of a nickel, it's white. Gannon has a scar there also. Uh, little Johnny Gosh had a birthmark on his left chest about eight inches long. From looking at pictures of Jeff Gannon on the internet, it appears that he had a birthmark at one time and there's been an attempt to erase it. I personally talked to one of the youngsters who was involved in this network. I've talked to several of them. And he assures me that Jeff Gannon is, in fact, Johnny Gosh. Well, how did Johnny Gosh get from West Des Moines, Iowa, 12 years old, all the way with the phony press pass into the White House as of a few weeks ago? Well, what happened to Johnny? 
is that he was transported from West Des Moines, Iowa to Sioux City. He was placed on a farm for three weeks, sexually molested. He was taken to uh, the mountains in Colorado, placed in a cage in a, in, a, in a house of some sort or a cabin. And then later he was used as a sex slave. They didn't kill him, they didn't sacrifice him, although a number of these kids are sacrificed in satanic ceremonies. Now, he um, escaped with another young man, they stole a car, and in 1997, Johnny knocked on his mother's door at 2.30 in the morning, Noreen Gosh, and said she wanted, he wanted to talk to her. He was there with another young boy. He came in, he told Noreen, he says, Mother, I was kidnapped. I've been placed in a covert military CIA controlled, mind controlled project and used as a sex slave. He said, I can't come forward at this time because they will kill me. And then he left. Noreen says that's the last time she talked to him, 1997. Now, several years after that, uh, a girl named Burns, who was a producer for 2020, decided to do a story on the Johnny Gosh kidnapping and the Nebraska case. And she interviewed me. In fact, I spent five days with her, gave her the benefit of all my research, which is available to you folks also. And then she got a lead that Johnny was hiding out on an Indian reservation in northern Minnesota. She went there and flushed him out, and uh, he basically went into hiding. And now he shows up at the White House. He was a mind control victim. If you don't know anything about MKUltra mind control program, it came into this country through the German scientists after World War II. They were involved with the Nazis during the war and prior to World War II in developing robots and individuals to be used on command for anything that they wished, including assassinations and other nefarious activity. The MKUltra program, CIA mind control program, was investigated by Congress in 1987. Congress said, CIA, you got to quit doing that. That's a, you're bad boys. And they said, we will quit. Don't kid yourself. It's very active today. There are people like Barbara Hartwell out there who are mind control victims. She's another one who's been bashing me. I must be doing a pretty good job because I wouldn't have these people criticizing me on the internet like they do. And of course, it doesn't bother me in the least. But going back to the Nebraska case, the MK Ultra, a lot of this training took place at Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska, which was uh, Strategic Air Command headquarters. You recall after 9-1-1, the president flew to, uh, I think it was to the south, someplace in Louisiana or New Orleans, uh, and then he flew to Offutt Air Force Base in the afternoon of September the 11th, 01. And they had a party there that morning at 9.30 in the morning. He missed the party. He was sorry he missed the party. Warren Buffett was there, by the way. And M the MK Ultra program has been very actively administered, not only at Offutt Air Force Base, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, the place where Dr. McDonald's family was slaughtered in 1970. Now, the Nebraska case, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to leave that without telling you that in the early 1990s, Yorkshire TV came to the United States with a camera crew for seven months to do a documentary on it. They went back to England, produced the documentary, and they brought it over into the United States. It was listed in the TV guide to be aired on May the 3rd, 1994. When certain members of Congress found out about it, they threatened the cable industry with restrictive legislation. Somebody anonymously bought up the rights 
to the videotape for the documentary and ordered all copies destroyed. I just happen to have a bootleg copy of that documentary and it is available. I have been selling these and these books and getting this report out of mine to anybody that's interested in it. And by the way, I have a, a five package deal for you at about a 15% discount, 15 to 20% discount if you buy all five items. So about six months ago, as any good investigator would do, I said, I'm gonna get a copy of that TV guide. I didn't have a copy. Johnny Camp had one at one time, couldn't find it. That's typical of John, by the way. Good friend, great guy. Uh, and so I said, I'm gonna get my own copy. So I wrote to TV Guide people. And I received a copy of the TV Guide from May 3rd, 1994. 10 p.m. Discovery Channel. It's not listed. A nature show is listed instead on the new reprinted edition. I'm not gonna be outfoxed by these people. I went to the Los Angeles Times TV log. It's listed, Conspiracy of Silence. I called a friend of mine in Philadelphia and I said, check the TV log for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Conspiracy of Silence is listed in the Philadelphia Inquirer. The power of the press. They changed and reprinted the whole TV guide. It never has been shown publicly in the United States, and I doubt if it ever will be shown publicly. But as I said, it is available to you. Now, that's not the end of the story for me, because I am continuously probing, continuously working, continuously talking to various sources and putting it on paper and documenting and getting the word out. This is the direction that we have to go. Americans, for the most part, are oblivious to what's really going on behind the scenes. One of the things that, in addition to the McDonald case, that got me thinking was the Jack Kennedy assassination. So I took, checked into that, and by the way, I used to be in charge of the FBI in Dallas, and also I was in charge in Los Angeles after Dallas. So in checking into the Jack Kennedy assassination, I learned, no question about it, that it was a joint hit by the CIA and the Chicago mob. Sam Gene Canna, head of the La Cosa Nostra in Chicago, three days before he was to testify before Congress, was shot and killed, murdered. This uh, encouraged me to do some more checking into some of these national terrorist acts that have taken place and other cover-ups in the United States. I interviewed the Naval Intelligence Officer who on December 4, 1941, received information that, that the Japanese were going to bomb Pearl Harbor. We had broken the secret code of the Japanese. He told me personally, on December the 4th, he gave it to his superiors. They passed it up the line. After Pearl Harbor, he was subpoenaed to testify for Congress. His boss, called him in and said, don't worry about it, don't respond to the subpoena. Someday you'll know why. He never did testify before Congress. And he recently passed on, by the way. So we have not only a cover-up in these other areas, but looking at the national picture, Pearl Harbor. And look at Waco. The military was involved in destroying and shooting and killing, and also the FBI, women and children in Waco. They used tanks, military tanks, in violation of posse comitatus, which is a law that says the military cannot be used to enforce a civilian population. They got away with it. There's an interesting story. I did some research on Waco. As I've told you, I've done a lot of research. And I've, in many instances, I've not only been there, I've done that, and 
I've been on the scene. I've spent most of my retirement money uh, investigating these matters, including Oklahoma City, and I'll go into that in just a minute, 911 and so forth. Uh, but in Waco, there were four BATF agents who were shot and killed. Some of the Branch Davidians were tried, sentenced for these, quote, murders, and are serving prison terms today, probably for life. In researching the four BATF agents who were shot, I learned every one of them was shot in the head. Now, for those of you who have been in the military, that's a sniper shot, no question about it. One of me, the bullet, the trajectory of the bullet was from above, down through his lip, and into his body, probably from a helicopter. It's interesting to note that these four men, BATF agents, at one time were all bodyguards for a former president Bill Clinton, Wait, that was Waco. Ruby Ridge. Randy Weaver was set up by a BATF, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Farms informant. He bought a shotgun that was about a quarter of an inch too short by law. They arrested him and served him with a warrant he refused to appear before the courts, and they sent an army after him. Horiuchi, the F FBI sharpshooter, shot and killed his wife while she was standing in the doorway. He used to brag about what a great shot he was. Another instance where they tried to railroad a good, loyal American who, was, who fell in a trap. And then we have the 1993 continuing with the great conspiracy. I call this a great conspiracy, and that's what it is. Car bombing of the World Trade Center. I have a copy of the New York Times, October 28, 1993. And in the article, this was uh, reporting from the trial that took place, an FBI informant named Salam, who was in among the terrorists, testified that he was commissioned by the terrorists to put the bomb together, the car bomb together, to bomb the World Trade Center in February 1993. And fortunately for him, when he met with the terrorists, he wore a body mark, mic, so he could record every word that was said. Unknown to the FBI, when he met with the FBI, he also wore a body mark. That was probably what kept him from being set up and framed and sent to prison. This is actually in this newspaper article. He went to his FBI superiors, says, I've been commissioned to put the bomb together. We're going to use a dummy bomb, aren't we? And he was told by his FBI superiors, no, we're going to use a real bomb. Now, I don't understand why Congress and Senate investigators and, the, and our, our leaders in Washington, D.C. are not jumping up and down over that situation. The FBI not only knew in advance of the car bombing, they furnished the ingredients for the bomb. Why doesn't somebody take some action in that area? Why doesn't somebody investigate? this international child kidnapping ring being operated by the CIA. Why are these congressmen voting on bills like the Patriot Act, which takes away many of our constitutional rights and civil liberties in the best interests of, quote, protection for our country and protection from the terrorists? Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. There are people in our government, a rogue outfit, whatever, I'm not sure, who are actually behind these terrorist acts. And the reason they're behind the terrorist acts is so they can pass bills like the Patriot Act. And the reason the congressmen and the senators vote for these stupid bills, stupid by our terms and our 
definition is because they've been, many of them have been set up and framed through sex and drugs. So then we have Oklahoma City, 1995. I personally made two trips to Oklahoma City. I investigated Oklahoma City. Because of my report, the defense attorney for Timothy o, uh, McVeigh sent his, two of his investigators to interview me. I spent four hours with them. Actually, uh, I got a lot of information out of them. For example, they told me that they were allowed to tour the remains of the Murrah building in Oklahoma City in the presence of a U.S. Marshal, but they were not allowed under any circumstances to take soil samples or to pick up any evidence for examination. Stephen Jones was their attorney. I heard that they were going to tear down the building. Now, you can trace bombs through the, what they call the taggants, the chemicals. When I heard this, I called John DeCamp. I said, John, we've got to prevent that building from coming down. And I actually called an outfit in Chicago, the Pat Kennedy Group, who were specialists in examining uh, evidence of this type. And John called McVeigh's attorney, Jones, and because John had a client who was, he was representing, who was involved in the case, Jones said, I'll handle the paper, we'll have a hearing, we will prevent that building from coming down. The next thing we heard, the building was coming down. John called Jones, what's going on, and he had no good answer for it. That was evidence. I've been in many a crime scene, and it is critical that the evidence be preserved. That was a huge cover-up. McVeigh wrote a letter to his sister. McVeigh was in Special Forces. The government says, military says, oh no, he flunked out. He didn't flunk out. He was recruited out of Special Forces, according to him, a letter he wrote to his sister, to be trained to be a CIA assassin and also to work for the CIA international drug operation, both against the competition and for the CIA pro-drug people. McVeigh was, in my opinion, an MKUltra mind control victim. He was visited in prison in Oklahoma and in Colorado by Dr. Jolly West. This was secret, by the way. I happened to find out because I made some phone calls to the right people. Jolly West was one of the foremost leaders, along with Sidney Gottlieb, in the CIA's MK Ultra mind control operation. Why would somebody like Jolly West go interview McVeigh, not only in Oklahoma, but also in Colorado during the trial? Because he was a mind control victim himself. At one time, it was reported, I think in the U.S. News and World Report, that McVeigh had a microchip in his in his buttocks. Our military reportedly have been using microchips to keep track of their soldiers. The bomb in the truck allegedly was a fertilizer bomb. The government first announced that it was a 1,500 pound bomb and then a 2,500 pound bomb and I think it ended up being 4,800 pounds. That bomb that was in the truck destroyed half the building. A 4,800 pound fertilizer bomb, ammonia nitrate fertilizer bomb, dissipates and did not have the potential, the possibility of destroying that much of the building. After the Oklahoma City bomb went off, I had a call from a friend of mine, Michael Reconosudo. For those of you who are making notes, look up in the internet, R-I-C-O-N-O-S-C-I-U-T-O. -O -O. Michael Reconosudo. I've been working with Michael since the early 1980s, 82, that's when I first met him. He was a CIA agent 
operative for some two decades. He was also an FBI informant at one time. His father owned the Hercules Manufacturing in Silicon Valley, California. Hercules Manufacturing developed what is known as the electrohydrodynamic gaseous fuel device, which is a highly classified bomb. The bomb was actually manufactured by Dinah Bell out of Salt Lake City. Now, Michael, in the meantime, is in jail now, right today. In fact, I talked to him yesterday because he started to talk before the Brooks Committee about a very interesting case involving the Promise software. The Promise software was in a computer operation. They developed all kinds of intelligence information on you and I and every citizen in America. The uh, Department of Justice leased it for two years. At the end of two years, they refused to pay Bill and Nancy Hamilton the $10 million they owed them. Then the Department of Justice, through Earl Bryant, past president of United Press International, took that computer and sold it around the world. Sold it to the French, to the English, Israelis, the Canadians. Unknown to, <coughs> excuse me, unknown to these foreign countries, the officials in these foreign countries, there was a trap door in the computer. Very clever, huh? A trap door secretly allowed us, the U.S. government, to retrieve all the information they developed. Michael Reconosuto was the CIA agent who developed the trap door in the Promise software computer. And when Congress started to investigate it in the late 1980s, they called on Michael and we want you to testify. Michael received a threatening phone call two weeks before he was to testify. He claimed from a fellow named Vietnix, Peter Vietnix, U.S. Department of Justice, if you testify, you'll be sorry. Michael testified anyway. A few weeks later, was arrested for drugs, is now serving a 30-year prison sentence because he dared to expose these nefarious activities by this rogue criminal enterprise operating within the confines of the U.S. government. I got off a little on, I gave you a little background on Michael. Going back to Oklahoma City now, I want you to understand who Michael is. He's not some guy walking down the street with a grocery basket looking for a recycling center, okay? He has credibility. Now, Michael called me right after the Oklahoma City bomb went off, and he said, Ted, he called from prison, by the way. That's my bomb, meaning that Hercules developed it. That was not an ammonia nitrate bomb. Now, when that bomb was tested in 1982, I happened to be with a group of intelligence agents in Palm Springs waiting for the results of that test. It was tested in Area 51. It was underestimated because the power, it was so powerful that two of the technicians died. They underestimated the strength of it. This, I call it a barometric bomb. This barometric bomb, according to Michael, was what was in the car, not a fertilizer bomb. I have an Oklahoma City report on that. So what did I do as an investigator? Well, I went to the Piccaninny Arsenal in New Jersey, and I gave him the contract number, which I obtained through a science magazine. One of my associates actually did the research on that. And I gave the Piccaninny Arsenal the contract number. This is public. Uh, 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 available to the public, by the way. And the Picatinny Arsenal came back and said, there's no such contract here, even though I had the contract. And by the way, that's documented in my report. And I went to Dinah Nobel, who I knew manufactured it. And they didn't even bother to respond. It's interesting to note that a Dinah Nobel expert witness testified at the grand jury when they indicted McVeigh. In September, of 1995, some five or six months after the 19th of April, 1995, Oklahoma City. In September, there was a 
I lost my trend of thought there for a minute. Oh, there was an article in Fireman's Magazine. It was written by the editor of Fireman's Magazine. The information was obtained from the Oklahoma City Fire Department. And in that article, again, that's in my report, in that article, it states that four unexploded devices were taken out of the building. When people were in the building after the bombing, dying, they discontinued the rescue efforts for some five hours while they carried out a bunch of government files, men in blue suits of some sort, sweatsuits. So what I'm telling you is, Oklahoma City was perpetrated by certainly people other than McVeigh and Nichols. And now Roger Moore, if you read the paper recently, the gun dealer who claims that he was robbed of his guns in Arkansas and that that money was used to finance the Oklahoma City bombing. Roger Moore has been accused by Terry Nichols of being involved in it. Roger Moore denies it. Roger Moore, at the time of the Oklahoma City bombing, was an FBI informant. I had an inside investigator in Oklahoma City tell me that there were at least 11 other individuals involved in Oklahoma City. Okay, that brings us up. We've gone through Pearl Harbor, Waco, Ruby Ridge, car bombing 93, Oklahoma City 95. That brings us up to 911. As I said, Michael's in prison. I'm his, quote, investigator of record, which means I'm like an attorney. I should have access to him on a regular basis. I represent this man. For a year prior to 911, actually a year and a half, I tried to get in and see Michael. He was in prison in northern Pennsylvania. I was in the Philadelphia area. The Bureau of Prisons would not allow me to see him. I finally was able to talk to Michael in January 2003. I flew to the East Coast, spent three days with him. Michael told me that he had developed information from among his contacts in advance of 911 that they were going involved in using missiles, airplane missiles, and they were going involved in skyjackings. They were training Arab terrorists, and also he knew the identity of the person in the United States, an Arab who lived in Patterson, New Jersey, who was the leader of terrorist activity by the Arabs in this country. Now, Michael had this information because you're saying, how could Michael develop this information being in prison? Because I met with Osama bin Laden, along with Michael, and along with the State Department representative in the spring of 1986. At that time, I was contacted by former top Reagan, Ronnie Reagan official, who said, can we help the Afghan rebels? They were our friends then. And I called Michael, I said, what do you think? And he said, let's meet. So there was a fourth fellow there. We, we didn't know at the time it was Osama bin Laden. It's actually used the name Tim Osman, traveling under Turkish passport. But because of Michael, I passed the ball to him. I just arranged for the meeting and went on. But Michael traveled all over the world putting this package together to furnish the Afghan rebels with the surface air missiles that defeated the Soviets, really, shot down their helicopters. As a result of this, Michael developed sources inside the Arab world. And that's how Michael knew in advance about 9-1-1. Michael told the FBI on March the 20th, 2001, about this plan to use skyjack, skyjack airplanes and use them as missiles. He also furnished to the FBI, one of his 
sources, one of his confidential sources, inside the Arab group. The FBI interviewed him, threatened him with prosecution, and deported him. That man, along with his family, have disappeared. We think that they're dead. The FBI refused, absolutely refused, to look into this situation. More shocking is that Michael had the names of the people who were obtaining the false names of the people, the Arabs, who were obtaining false passports. Had their names. He had the source who could furnish him that information. He told FBI agent Keith Kutry, March 20th, 1990, 2001, excuse me. He told Kutry, he says, I'll give you these names, the name of this person who's coordinating the whole project for the Arabs, providing I be given immunity and he be given immunity. Mr. Kutry, in spite of the fact he was armed with this information six months prior to 911, came back two days after 911 on the 13th and saw Michael in prison again. Accused Michael of being anti-government, anti-FBI, of being a, a publicity seeker, and so forth, being disloyal. And so Michael, of course, didn't have much to say after that. Michael's still in prison, as I said. But we had this information, the FBI had this information, did nothing with it. <clears throat> Kutry admitted on March the third on September the thirteenth, admitted that the FBI did nothing with it. So after I visited Michael, <clears throat> excuse me, in two thousand three, I felt it was important that I confirm that the FBI did meet with him. The Bureau of Prisons would not furnish Michael with the the, the uh, visitors list to confirm it and so I started writing letters to the FBI through Senator uh, George Allen. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And to confirm that he did in fact meet with them, I wanted to document it. I also asked for the identity of the other agent who was with Agent Kutry and um, I had a terrible talk. It took me a year and a half writing letters to the FBI to get them to admit that they'd interviewed Michael on March the 20th, 2001. I finally did have that information. That information is available again in one of my reports, my uh, terrorism report that I have in the back. So that basically brings me up to the present time. I think my time is up. But I, I feel compelled as a former FBI agent, I had all this training and I feel compelled to do everything I can to educate as many uh, fellow Americans as I can as to what's going on behind the scenes. We have been operated and orchestrated primarily by U.S. military intelligence, covert criminal enterprise involving the FBI and the CIA. Active in this country today, it's being covered up Right from the beginning, they're using FBI informants to set up and frame people. By the way, they tried to frame me on a drug deal back in 1984. <clears throat> Didn't work. The girl that they used to try to frame me contacted me, said, I need to meet with you. We met. She told me the whole story. I took a signed statement from her. Her name is Pam Fawcett. And I said to Pam, I said, Pam, you're working for these people, the DEA and the FBI and Modesto, by the way. She was making phone calls to me. I said, you're working with these people trying to set me up. Why have you, and of course, in the phone calls, she kept saying, trying to get me to make admissions that had knowledge of a felony, and I wouldn't. I said, I don't have any knowledge of that, or was involved in a felony, actually. I said, Pam, look. You were working with these people for six months. They gave you $2,000. You had the run of the FBI office. You had your own coffee cup. Why did you come to me and tell me this now? And I'd helped her, give her a little advice about her 14-year-old son in the interim, you know, talking back and forth, as any individual would do who might be able to help. 
And she said, Ted, I woke up the other morning and I realized you're the only honest son of a bitch I've talked to in six months. Those were her exact words. The FBI not only tried to set me up on a, on a, on a drug deal, they've also, I've also been the victim of four separate investigations. They tried to set me up on a fraud case in, Denver, in uh, Dallas. And most recently, very frankly, I've been under surveillance, heavy surveillance, uh, has, uh, I've had illegal entries into my car, into my apartment. Uh, there's been attempts to gas me uh, within the last month. And I was able to anticipate it and avoid it. But they don't want people like me out telling the truth. And that's what I'm doing. And I will not stop. I will continue to do so in the future. So that's uh, basically it. I brought you from 1776 to the present time. We went through one conspiracy after another. Brian Gimble was interviewing Jim Nichols, uh, Terry Nichols' uh, brother on national TV uh, after the Oklahoma City bombing, by the way. And I had given Jim Nichols my Oklahoma City bombing report. And Jim said to Brian Gumbel, he says, have you read Ted Gunderson's Oklahoma City report? And Gumbel says, oh, Ted Gunderson's a conspiracy theorist. I want you to know I'm not a, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a conspiracy realist. It is there. All you have to do is get your own website, get your own internet, Go out. There's a lot of disinformation out there, but you can pick up what's really solid and what's really truthful. And I have done, I have 25 years of research on that back table back there. And if you buy any of my reports or this videotape or any of my material, I want you to make a promise that you will make copies and distribute it far and wide. We need to wake up America. Right now, let me emphasize again, I'm not anti-American. I don't believe in uh, violence. I believe in change through legal means. But we need to wake up an apathetic, sleeping society that is active in America today. And this not only ties into MKUltra, CIA, it ties into Satanism. There are approximately four million practicing Satanists in America today involved in the Nebraska case. And I can go on about satanic cults for another hour, but I think my time is almost up. I might mention that speaking of Satanism, there are between 50 and 60,000 human sacrifices, according to three different sources, in this country every year. The satanic cults operate secretly, the satanic cults are, along with our covert criminal enterprise within the government, a serious threat to our society. And I thank you very much.